Welcome back to Taste of Gen Z. I'm your co-host, Jonathan Ortega. I'm the other co-host, Jake Davies. And um, today we're here to talk about exactly what our name is, the Taste of Gen Z, what that music entails, and how our, our generation listens to music. As you can see, I'm a music expert. Jake here is also a music expert. And we're going to be deep, diving deep into what kind of songs make up our generation today. So Jake, you want to tell them what we did? Um, well, we actually picked three songs for today's episode. Um, we'll get into those a little bit later. Um, but I think before we get into that, I think it's important for our audience to understand, you know, our experience with music um, and, you know, maybe how that's affected our lives. Uh, so I'll start out here. Um, you know, I, uh, so I have about 17 years of music listening experience. Um, when I was in the womb, my mom would actually uh, play music for me. Um, and I think, you know, that probably is what contributed to my love of music now. Um, uh, personally, I'm not a big fan of, of some of this modern music that's been coming out in recent years. Uh, there's been a lot of garbage, but there are a lot of songs that um, convey great messages and great meanings that really define our generation. And we'll get into those later. Um, personally, some of my favorite brands are Nirvana, The Beatles, The Rolling Stones, Coldplay, um, and modern uh, artists. I'm a big fan of Post Malone. Um, that's about it. Um, so, Jonathan, why don't you tell us a little bit about, you know, your music background and, um, you know, why you consider yourself to be a music expert? Sure. So, kind of like you, I grew up with music, 18 years of experience. Um, my dad would always play, like, classics. He'd play Led Zeppelin. He'd play, um, I know that a lot of people now think Roxanne is, a, you know, a Arizona song, but I listened to the original one with The Police, you know. I grew up listening to all these different types of music and it definitely has influenced the kind of music I listen to now. Uh, I'd have to agree with you. I think now because of how easy it is to make music, some of it does tend to be a little bit more trash, but we'll get into kind of the trends and overall barriers of the new generation of music in another episode. I think today what we could talk about is, you know, like you were saying, you have past uh, older bands that you like, so the Beatles, Nirvana, I'm definitely the same. I like Bob Marley. Um, I like a lot of OG Kanye. I know it's not that old, but, um, and then today's music, you know, I'm also a fan of Post Malone. I like a lot of, you know, I kind of like everything. I'm not a countryman myself, but I can see maybe why I would like it, not really. Um, but today what we did was we interviewed uh, a bunch of students in our class. We were both uh, 17, 18 years old, seniors in high school. And we kind of got a general census of what the top defining songs are of this past 20 years. You know, the 2000s, early 2000s has been defined by a lot of different cultural changes, a lot of different um, modern aspects have taken place. And now we can kind of dive into music, how music shaped into forming the culture that we have today. So, Jake, do you want to go into kind of the first song that everyone seemed to vote for? Uh, yeah, we'll get into the first song in a minute, but just something came to my mind while uh, you were talking. Um, so, our generation is kind of the first generation to grow up with smartphones, and, um, and with that, we have obviously music streaming apps like Spotify, Pandora, Apple Music, Tidal, um, and I just have a question for you. How do you think um, that has affected the music taste of our generation? And um, what do you think the benefits are to that? Maybe are there any negatives to that? Yeah, so I think that's a good point. You know, I personally been subscribed to Spotify for the past at least five years. And it's made making finding music and listening to it very easy. You know, before you'd have to buy individual albums, or individual songs. And, you know, it just kind of was hard to justify spending all this money so you can listen to only a select number of songs. So when this came out, it was a game changer, really. And what it means is that our generation, the ones that grew up with the smartphones and kind of get used to, are able to adapt quickly to this kind of new uh, platform, is that we are able to listen to a lot of different music. Like, I know my playlist has 400 songs, all ranging from songs in, like, the 60s to songs about, you know, 
songs of hip hop and you know indie and all these different types of genres and i think a lot of other people our age can do that too so it kind of gives us a better understanding of where influence came from back then what uh, you know our parents or our grandparents listened to and how maybe it took shape in the people that they are today you know i kind of i kind of like the idea that music is one part of our culture and is really defines the community and defines what the United States is about in particular. Our kind of music has been able to go worldwide and it's really helped in defining, you know, besides our music taste and what we like to hear, it's also the messages and the kind of resonating effect that these songs have on our future generations. All right. So with that, I think it's about time we get into the first song here. Um, so we polled a few of our friends and um, one of the most commonly requested songs um, that defined our generation was Viva La Vida by Coldplay. Um, yeah, person, one, it's one of my personal favorites for sure. Um, so this was uh, the album that followed X and Y, which um, uh, featured Speed of Sound, which actually was their, which reached top 10 on the billboards. Um, but what I find really interesting about this is that, you know, when they brought on their new producer, Brian Eno, um, mm-hmm. who also worked with, you know, David Bowie, U2, um, I think it really helped them kind of define their sound that uh, we kind of identify with Coldplay today. Um, because in, in, in their first three albums, you know, their music was really reserved and um, the lyrics were kind of vague. But I feel like with this song, it kind of marked the beginning of a, um, a more like meaningful Coldplay. Um, The lyrics carry more weight to them. Um, And I think this is when they started to really become an influential influential band, not only, you know, in their home country of the UK, but internationally as well. Definitely. Um, I think that I couldn't agree with you more. Honestly, it's one of the few songs in our generation that like everyone loves. Like it's hard to hate that song, you know, it's such a good message. It's got, you know, a great sound. It's, it's singable, which is something that really resonates with a lot of our generation. So do you kind of want to delve deeper into what the song talks about and kind of what the overlaying message is? Yeah. So um, before I delve into, you know, kind of the deeper meaning, let me just give you some background info on, you know, um, on the song in general. So the namesake for the song actually came um, when the band was in, oh, before they actually wrote the song, they were kind of touring all across the globe. and just kind of experiencing the world. Um, And the namesake for this uh, song actually came from a Frida Kahlo painting um, that had the words Viva La Vida written across it. Um, And one of the things that I find interesting is that a piece of the song, the chanting part, you know, the the, like beat to the song, the boom, 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 was actually recorded um, in a Spanish cathedral to give it that, you know, kind of echo and kind of, um, deeper sound that gives it that strength behind it, you know, that kind of pushes the song along. Right. Um, and so just to get into some of the lyrics here, um, Viva La Vida kind of, in my opinion, it tells the story of a king who lost his kingdom. You know, at the beginning of the song, um, they talk about sweeping the streets that he used to own. Once it was his great kingdom, and now he, the next day he had nothing. He was sleeping alone, sweeping the streets that he used to own. And I think um, personally, um, right now, this kind of makes me think about um, what we're missing in school. Um, Like we were all, we were in the glory days, you know, living out our last few weeks at St. Ignatius. Um, Things were going great. And then all of a sudden the next day we're trapped inside, quarantined and missing, you know, some of the best days of our life. And I think this song kind of portrays a similar message. Um, You know, you don't really know you're in the good times when you're actually in them. It's kind of something that you have to reflect back on when you know when you look back on your life and you know when you're older um yeah so that made me think of like what we're going through now with the coronavirus missing out on the best days of our life oh yeah and then i, uh, where I think um, one thing that speaks from the song is you were talking about how there was a chant recorded in the spanish cathedral and i think uh, I don't know if you could agree with me here, but it, the song kind of has like a, almost like a religious undertone. Like it sounds, um, what's the word? It sounds like, 
I wouldn't even know how to describe it, but you get what I'm saying. It sounds that mm-hmm. it's able to be something that speaks to more than just the outside level. It kind of has a deeper meaning in it. Um, do you? Th- I don't know that much about Coldplay as a, as like a band, but do you know if this song was religious at all, if it was meant to be the way? Um, I would say there's definitely some religious undertones to the song. Um, they actually do reference a uh, Catholic saint um, at the end, Saint Peter, um, mm-hmm. when he says in the final line, or in one, of, it's like the second to last line. He says, "I know Saint Peter won't call my name." And what I what I kind of got from that is like, when when we when we're done with our life, like we're analyzed on it. Like even the biggest names in history, like history is basically just about like analyzing what certain people did. And the the idea that like our life is analyzed after we lived it is, is something that's, you know, very concerning. And it, it really makes you think about the choices you're making, um, both personally, professionally, you know, um, and, ha- you know, how that impacts others around you and, you know, your own community. And I think the song definitely has, um, it definitely kind of encourages um, community building, I'd say. Um, I don't know if you agree with that statement, but I feel like it's kind of, almost like a call to, you know, make actions or make choices, make decisions that, you know, when we look back on our life, we say we're proud of, you know, we're like, or we feel fulfilled. Hmm. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. So I think that Coldplay's music overall, or at least going forward from this song has been very encouraging, very uplifting kind of uh, the music that's supposed to motivate. And, you know, I really get a sense of that from this song. It teaches a message of don't take for granted what you have now. And you were talking how that connects with today and how we're missing out on some of our, not just our grade as seniors, but also everyone's missing out on things that they usually took for granted. You know, I find myself missing small things and you don't think you will miss that until you know, it's actually gone. And I think that's what this song's about. So maybe it's trying to reach out to, you know, not just, you know, I feel like Coldplay is able to resonate with a few more uh, different age groups, but because of that, you know, the overlying message of being able to um, take advantage now of what we're living in, in a, in a world that's, or at least in a country, in a world that's focused on, you know, looking towards the future, making, you know, making sure that you have successful life, you know, um, family, you know, all these ideals that are preached in other songs, I think they're talking more about living in the moment, live what's for you, don't you know, act fast or that's all going to go away. So I think that's a really cool um, message from Coldplay. And I think it's helped shape at least part of the music industry that's been formed today. Right. I definitely agree with that. The song is just basically echoing how unpredictable our lives are. Um, and, you know, that's, that can be, that can be scary. You know, we don't really know what's going to happen. Um, we just kind of live our day-to-day lives and hope for the best, but, um, I think the song really, as I said previously, it has a very positive theme um, and just emphasizing good choices, good decisions that, you know, when we look back on our life, you know, we can hope that St. Peter does call our name, you know, um, and that we're proud of, proud of the life we lived. Um, so with that, uh, unless you have any other final comments, uh, what do you say we move on to the second song? Right. So, you know, I think that Coldplay has definitely been one of the most defining bands, at at least band wise, has been one of the most defining uh, artists in these past 20 years. But, you know, a complete 360 from that, another song that was mentioned when um, we were interviewing some of our classmates was that um, the song Empire State of Mind by Jay-Z. And personally, I, I love this song. Like, it's so catchy. It's easy to kind of bump to. And it's, you know, a completely different genre from Viva La Vida. It's a little more peppy. It's a little more dancey. Um, but overall, I'll give you some background info on this. It was rated for the Blueprint 3, which is uh, kind of following the sequel of albums that Jay-Z has been making over the past 10 years um, at that time. Uh, so in 2009, he uh, made the song with Alicia Keys, and it won the hearts of like everyone as soon as it came out. It was it became famous ridiculously quick. Uh, the catchy beat, a good a good mix of both the vocals, it really worked well together. Um, made Empire State of Mind one of Jay Z's most notable tracks, and easily one of the most referenced songs about New York, his home state. 
So mm -hmm. kind of talking about like how, how like the gravity of this song, we can see it through how successful it became. It took home multiple awards from the Grammy Award for Best Rap Song and Best Performance in one year, the MTV Video Music Award for Best Cinematography, three BET Awards for Best Collaboration, Best Hip Hop Duo, and Best Hip Hop Video. On Spotify, the song has over like 211 million downloads on playlists, and it charts as one of the most popular songs. Um, have you ever listened to this song? I'm sure you've listened to this song, actually. How do you feel about it, personally? Um, well, this is one of the songs that, you know, back in the day, I would hear it all the time, but you know, now it's something that it's not as common, but but when it does play, it really just puts you in a good mood. It's um, having been to New York two times, I can't say that, you know, I'm the biggest fan of the city, but, you know, I don't know, something about the song just makes me want to go to a Yankees game and, you know, eat a few hot dogs and explore you know, the concrete jungle. I think that's what he refers to it as. Yeah, I mean, that's probably one of the most memorable lines, actually. Um, it's got that fantastic chorus that everyone knows by Alicia Keys, you know, the, in New York, the concrete jungle, uh, where dreams are made of, there's nothing you can't do. Now you're in New York. And that's what you were talking about. This theme of overall glorification in New York, it has, it's not something new, um, but it was something that was really like hit home with Jay-Z and how influential he's become in the past few years and the that how his upbringing and you know, the characteristics that were built as a result of being in New York were able to make a part of this song. Um, it takes in for inspiration from Frank Sinatra's song, New York, New York, I'm sure you've heard that. And he even references it in like the song with the I'm New Sinatra, and since I made it here, I can make it anything else I do in the um, But, you know, even though he glorifies this, uh, New York, he it, he doesn't do it misjustice. He points out that there isn't always, and not everything's perfect about New York, but the idea that this song became so popular and this song, you know, resonates with not only a lot of New Yorkers for sure, but a lot of people within the country, um, kind of points out where a community's at as at this point at 2009, you know, the American dream um, of making it big and, you know, um, all these different uh, ideal lifestyles and how Americans view uh, business, money, the grit that New York brings and success overall. Um, I really think that it points out uh, how our generation is defined, really. I mean, you talk to anyone and maybe in our class and they'll tell you that they want to do this, they want to do that. They're trying to set their, their lives planned out so they can reach that point that he talks about, the success, the money, the fame, the ability to win based off of your grit and your willingness to succeed and work hard. Um, I really think it's had an overall influence on the type of music that goes on from that point forward, but it also not only affected the music, but the way that people view New York and America in general. What do you think? Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Um... Even today, you still hear the American dream referenced a lot, you know, coming to America and um, making it big in business, money. And I think one thing that the song does a great job of is emphasizing that, you know, success isn't something that's that's random. You know, there's there's a formula for success, like grit, toughness and just the continual dedication to what you're doing. Um, and I think personally, um, this says a lot about, you know, obviously New York is kind of. Um, defined as a pretty uh, tough city. Um, the same with Chicago, you know, we're known for our, our grit, you know, our, our strength. Um, and I think that, you know, because of that, this song was able to resonate with a lot of people, you know, a lot of people are, are struggling every day, you know, just to, just to make ends meet. Um, and I think the song kind of, uh, it definitely kind of brought, you know, America closer together uh, in a way, like we're all struggling uh, through the same, th well, we're all struggling through, you know, the same, you know, economic issues, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this song is kind of uh, a song of hope that is kind of like, well, let's get out of the bad times. We can get through this together. We're, you know, we're, we're tough. We're gritty. You know, we've been doing this for a long time and, you know, we can finally make it happen if, if you just stick to it. Yeah. And I think, Jay-Z as a person, as someone that continues to make music, really defines those ideals, the idea that 
um, we're all struggling one way or another through different abuses. And one thing that he made clear a few years ago, and you know, this is something that uh, it's been happening a lot recently, is he took his music off Spotify. So I wasn't able to even listen to these type of songs for a long time because he took on the title. And whether or not that was because he wanted to promote his own music service, that's one thing. But I think something that he pointed out um, is how the music industry is willing to take advantage of the people that actually make the songs and undermines the amount of hard work and dedication they put into releasing this type of music. So he stood up for not only himself, but a lot of other artists in saying that we deserve more, right? We, um, he realizes the injustices in the uh, music industry in America, and he motivates others to kind of do the same thing, kind of realize where that injustice lies and stand up to it. So I think, you know, overall, even though the song is really catchy, the meaning, the person, the influence behind all of it is really a good summation of what America's like and how we are able to identify with at least our generation um, what it's, you know, this really resonates with us the most and kind of is able to um, set forth like the mindsets that we have in the future. Um, so unless you have anything else to say, did you want to dive into our last song? Uh, just a quick comment. I know you mentioned uh, some of the corruption in the music industry, and I don't think a lot of people are super familiar with that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's really most common in, uh, I'd probably say, the rap industry. A lot of, because, you know, because of uh, platforms like SoundCloud, we're seeing a lot of, like, one-and-done artists. Mm -hmm. um, and because of that, like, record labels are taking advantage of them, signing them to, like, crappy deals that they don't even read. Um, and one thing that record labels do, which is, is very, very um, bad, and this is actually part of the reason, um, I wouldn't say it's the cause of Juice World's death, but it, it definitely put him down uh, the wrong road. Record labels would actually um, bribe him with different drugs to get them to sign or, and to get different artists to sign. And it's just something that, you know, it obviously puts the rappers um, uh, down a very poor uh, path. And... Um, it's obviously not healthy for the music industry as a whole. Um, but yeah, Jay-Z definitely uh, has, is, is standing out for his fellow artists um, with this song. Um, and I, you also mentioned that uh, like in today's world, like a lot of people. Here, one second, Jake. Uh, the, the video is kind of, kind of nicely to our neck uh, on rhythm um, because here, wait, Jake. Jake yeah, so, so because it's unwritten, it kind of the the video like lagged out for a second. So do you want to just finish your last point before you uh, repeat your last point before you go into unwritten? Um, it, yeah. You left off at you know it led him down the wrong path because these companies are willing to bribe with drugs and uh, signing into contracts that these artists don't know for the better of themselves that it's going to end up being their downfall. Yeah, right. So basically what I was saying is like the music industry now is kind of, it's not putting as much emphasis on the actual art um, that is music and it's, it's putting more emphasis um, on just making money, right. um, which obviously that undermines both the artist and the music industry as a whole because, you know, um, I mentioned SoundCloud, we're getting a lot of, you know, one hit wonders, one and done rappers um, that, that literally are just being taken advantage of for the money. And it's kind of taking a lot of the art aspect out of music. Um, and then uh, just to get to Unwritten, uh, you were saying earlier that a lot of people in our generation, you know, think they have to have their whole life planned out um, ahead of them. And uh, Natasha Bedingfield in this song um, actually kind of contradicts that uh, with a lot of her lyrics. So it's, um, she had a year old brother. Um, birthday present as a birthday present because she didn't uh, have enough money to buy him an actual present. So she decided to write him a song. Um, so one of the first uh, lyrics is um, stare is like staring at a blank page before you or an unwritten page. Um, and I think this is kind of referencing like, you know, when we look, we uh, think about what's ahead of us, what our future holds. Like a lot of people, they kind of want to fill that blank page with, you know, I want to do this, I want to do this, I want to do this. Um, 
but you know what Natasha is saying uh, is that uh, our future, even if we have it super planned out, it's always going to be um, a blank page. We're never really going to know what's going to happen to us. Um, and I feel like that kind of uh, provides a, a pretty uh, good commentary about um, a lot of the struggles that you know we face in our generation. Because I feel like in recent years, um, you know, we've been placing a lot more emphasis on test scores, grades, college, like what you're going to do after college. Like a lot of people expect you, I don't know, I'm sure you've experienced this, but just about anywhere I go, I get asked, oh, where are you going to college? Oh, what are you majoring in? What are you going to do when you get out? Um, and yeah, so what this song does is it kind of, it, it's almost like, like, hey, it's okay, you know, you don't need to have your whole life planned out ahead of you. Um, which I think is um, really resonates with our generation because, you know, like I said, there's so much more emphasis on, you know, getting good grades, getting good test scores and just having everything figured out when in reality, like no one really knows what, what they want to do with themselves. I know I don't. Yeah, sure. Um, I think that the idea we're supposed to no, and you know some of this music, not this song in particular, but some of the music that we listen to now promotes this idea that we're supposed to know what to do by the age of seventeen. We're supposed to have our whole life planned out, but really, we're still kids, right? And the idea that we're supposed to know the next sixty, seventy, eighty years ahead of us at this age is kind of something that I think Natasha does a good job of uh, combating the idea that we need to follow a set path um, that you're only considered successful if you make money or you uh, reach certain criteria, certain social status. And really, I think Natasha does a good job of kind of explaining that that's not all that it is. You know, it's a perception. It's something that has influenced a lot of our generation um, through music, through uh, movies, through success stories and talking about, you know, coming from rags to riches. It's all that stuff that's really discussed in the song. And I think, you know, as catchy as it might be staring at the blank page before you, you know, I like the song a lot personally. Um, you know, you'll catch, you'll catch me bumping it in the car with the homies. But um, I think overall, even the fact that it was used as um, a song that I heard during Kairos, you know, not everyone's gonna know what that is, but, um, the idea that you can use this song to better understand oneself, to um, better understand that there's more to life than the material things, I think is something that this song does a really good job of. So unless you wanted to say any last thoughts on written, um, I was going to introduce what our next podcast will be about and what we can, what, what our viewers can do to uh, tune into us in the future. Um, yeah, just I just like to reference this this one last lyric here in Unwritten. Um, it's today is where your book begins; the rest is still unwritten. Mm -hmm. And um, in, in, in earlier in the song, she actually uh, there's a line that says, "The pen's in my hand," um, and I think that's a really interesting analogy. Um, like on your life, like each day is is like the beginning, like, and you don't know what's gonna happen from there. You just kind of go with the flow. And, uh, you know, she also says, live your life with your arms wide open. And I think what she's saying there is just, you know, you'll, you'll have opportunities and, you know, don't be quick to shut anything down or like dismiss someone, like dismiss someone or dismiss something or like, you know, don't be afraid to, you know, take advantage of every opportunity you get. And, um, yeah. So yeah, let's wrap it up. And right. Um, so Let's see, we can, we can mention a few honorable mentions. Um, when we were doing this poll, some people answered uh, Thrift Shop, which I know is a personal favorite of yours, by McNamore and Ryan Lewis. Absolutely, um, hit that song. <laughs> um, we got, uh, let's see, oh, Mr. Brightside by The Killers, uh, Wonderwall by Oasis. I mean, the music that really defines a generation is all over the place. And I think that was something that, our generation kind of embodies the most is that since we have access to all these different uh, genres, all this different history of music, our music taste is formed by a lot more influences than it used to be back then. Um, 
And right. something you alluded to before when we were talking about the uh, the business of music as a whole and how it's starting to become more of a cash grab than a true appreciation of the art. You know, next episode we can look more into what the effects of music is on our younger generation, specifically with the rap and hip hop industry promoting lives of you know party drugs and fame and you know whether that's a good or a bad thing and how it got to there in the first place so we'll dig deep into the history of rap and hip-hop um and kind of go back to back into the older times before our age um you know where that came from so unless you have anything else to say um yeah just a few quick comments so i think uh next week next week's episode as john said is going to focus on um, kind of modern rap music and how that's influencing um, us, our generation, and also uh, our, the younger generation. Um, so, and then the week after that, we're going to focus on, you know, older music, probably from around the 60s to the 90s. Um, and as John was saying, with Spotify, our music tastes are much more diverse. Um, so we can actually, we've, our generation's actually been influenced by, you know, a huge range of music. Um, and with that, um, we'd also love to hear uh, from our viewers suggestions for songs to look into for next week. Um, so please feel free to leave suggestions um, of modern rap music that we can look into. And um, also, if you have any ideas for uh, the episode two weeks from now, uh, don't be afraid, you know, drop a few songs in the comment section and uh, we'll be sure to check them out. Right. So, um... Thank you guys for tuning in. We will be posting weekly on our YouTube channel, Taste of Gen Z. Uh, I'm Jonathan Ortega. I'm Jake Davies, and this has and been Taste of Gen Z. Peace.